Well, good morning, y'all. I, uh, before I begin, I want to give a shout out to a few people. I want to thank uh, John Doyle, who turned our crimson into purple here in the auditorium. So, so new colors, and I'm sporting my purple shirt in solidarity with that. Uh, and then uh, I also want to thank uh, Mr. Marty Metz is in here somewhere. Uh, Marty worked hard to create, we created a new bleacher system up there. So welcome all the Westridge first bleacher bums up there. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know who always lurked down here in the floor, we actually put a bar up there with high stools and screens are going up there. So Steve Van Geem and his team are installing all the screens up there. So making sure that they're not sleeping up there in the mez, right? So, but thanks to everyone who uh, put in a whole lot of work. Uh, today we are uh, continuing in our series entitled An Overview of the Bible. As Greg and I have been uh, walking through really week by week through the Bible, highlighting what we, we believe are some of the most important points that really help to connect the dots so that everybody can see the, the connectivity of the overall story of, of the Bible. And what our hope is, is that by the end of this series that we can all have a, a systematic theology for ourselves. And by that I mean a framework of the main tenets of the Christian faith as taught in the Bible that really sets it apart from other religions and worldviews so that we can really discern what it is that we really believe. And we've really thought it through, and we, when we say we believe this, we really believe it. And today's message is probably the most critical, I would say, as to our belief system, as this, what we're going to talk about today, sets uh, Christianity apart from everything else. So everything, really, that we've studied up until this point there are other world religions that follow all of that and believe all of that. So uh, the Jewish tradition, Islam, even Buddhism accepts the Old Testament and the things, everything that we've been taught. But now as we transition to the New Testament, this is what makes Christianity uniquely Christian. All right? So the story of Jesus is found in the first four books of the New Testament that we call the Gospels. The word gospel means good news, and the four gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And these books were written by uh, leaders of the early church. So, for example, uh, Matthew and John were two of the 12 disciples of, of Jesus. So these four books contain the record of the life and teaching of Jesus Christ as he was here on this earth. And so picking up where we left off last Sunday we talked about the religious leaders that had control over religion of that day, known as the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, and then the, the leadership team, the council that oversaw all of those groups were called the Sanhedrin, which were made up of a mix of all of them. But, but these guys really made religion uh, p politicized and highly judgmental and exclusive and what was happening was that the religious leaders were actually keeping common people away from God. You may remember the words of Jesus that I read last week from the Gospel of Matthew 23 when he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of heaven in people's faces. And you yourselves do not enter, nor will you let anybody else enter who's trying to. So the religious leaders were actually keeping people away from God. And if the religious leaders of that day were considered to be the gatekeepers of God and religion and the law that they were using was the lock, then Jesus was the one who came to break the gate down and make God accessible to everyone for the first time. Because Jesus, he raised the bar and he moved the fence. So Jesus is coming onto the scene in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, and he's standing, the scene that we're going to talk about this morning is Jesus is standing on the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee, and he's about to deliver his first big sermon. Now, if you ever want to know, and you ever want to read in just a very short snippet, all of the ins and outs of what the Christian faith should and should not be, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5 through 7, very easy read, Jesus gives the Sermon on the Mount. 
And in that, he lays out everything within the Christian life. And so if you pick up and read that, I think that would be really beneficial. But the Bible says that there were so many people, as he gets ready to deliver this sermon, there were so many people crowding against him along the shoreline that he actually has to jump into a boat, move the boat away from shore so that he can see everybody, make eye contact, and be able to deliver his message effectively. But what was it? What was it about this guy that was so different, that was so compelling? Well, as Jesus begins to speak, he begins to say things that they'd never heard before. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Jesus all of a sudden didn't teach rules. He didn't teach spiritual arrogance. He didn't teach religion. He taught hope. He taught compassion. And most of all, he taught love. So what these religious leaders had done previously was basically to take the law of Moses and to use it to build a fence around themselves to create a standard that says, we're in and you're out. Unless you can live up to our standards, you're on the other side of the fence. We're inside the fence and we're untouchable. No one can be as good as us. And so they built this fence to keep common folk out, or as Jesus describes it, to shut the door of heaven into people's faces. For them, it was all about the religiosity of of doing and saying the right things and looking good and gaining uh, political power as they could. And it had nothing to do with having a relationship with God. The religious leaders believed that they had a special place in heaven because they believed they kept the law perfectly. But what happens is that Jesus comes on the scene and he says something so radical in this Sermon on the Mount that nobody can believe it. Because Jesus looks right over at the religious leaders who are standing off to the side and he just lays into them and he says, for I, I tell you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you certainly will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now you have to remember that the Pharisees believed themselves to be the standard for heaven. They made the bar so that it was the Pharisees who were at the top of the heap. So none of us can really grasp the full enormity of Jesus' statement at that time, but let's set aside for a second that he just annihilates the religious leaders of the day who deserved it, right? But think about the average person who is sitting in the crowd on the shore of Galilee listening to all of this. What do you think they were thinking? I'm guessing they were thinking, dang, if the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees aren't going to make it into heaven? (laughs) Where does that leave me? Because I'm not nearly as good. I'm not nearly as religious as them. And before anyone has a chance to respond, Jesus does something incredible. He takes the law. He says, I'm not here to abolish the law. I'm not here to get rid of the law. I'm here to make it what it should be. And Jesus takes the law and he begins to systematically raise the bar just like this. You have heard that it was said, do not commit murder. One of the core tenets of the law, right? One of the core tenets of the Ten Commandments, don't don't commit murder. So here's the bar. Don't kill anybody, right? And Jesus says, but I tell you, anybody who gets angry with somebody... 
Anybody who holds a grudge against somebody, anybody who is not willing to forgive somebody that has done something against you, the bar is going up. So now the bar isn't down here, just don't kill anybody and you'll be fine. The bar is now, don't get angry, don't hold a grudge, or you're going to be in danger of hell too. I bet you could have heard a pin drop. Nobody interpreted the law like that. But he doesn't stop there. He continues to raise the bar just a little higher. He says, you've heard that it was said, don't commit adultery. But then he raises the bar again. He says, look, if anybody looks upon somebody else in a lustful way, they have committed adultery in their heart. Ouch. He goes on. You heard that it was said, love your neighbor. Jesus said, and hate your enemy. But Jesus said, Jesus, Jesus raised the bar again. He says, but I say, love your enemy and pray for those people who don't like you. He says, if you love those who love you, big whoop. Like if you love your family because everybody loves each other, so what? Even the pagans do that. Even people who don't believe in God can have a little love fest within the people for the people that they love. But love your enemies. Love the people who have done wrong against you. Are you kidding me? And just when you thought it couldn't get any worse and the bar couldn't get any higher, Jesus just levels it and says, be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now that you've heard what the real spirit of the law is and all of these aspects of the law, keep all of that perfectly. I don't know about you, but the bar just got out of reach for me. So Jesus redefines the law, and he pulls the rug out from under anyone and everyone who thought that they were safe if they could just keep the Ten Commandments. Now the law is redefined to the point that nobody can keep the law perfectly, right? Jesus strips away every little bit of self-righteousness of the Pharisees and every little bit of the arrogance of the scribes and the, and the Sadducees, and he sweeps away all the religiosity and pride, and he says, now, now who among you still thinks you're all that? Now who among you can put yourselves up against everybody else, above everybody else? All of a sudden, Jesus changed the rules of religion. And I'm guessing everybody's kind of looking at each other going, okay, now what? Like, we're all a little screwed here, right? I mean, according to Jesus, we're all going to hell. So when we read that passage and we read what Jesus does, I think there's a sense of satisfaction that Jesus tears apart the religious leaders, right? I mean, I think we can all kind of get behind that. But then when all that goes away, and you go, okay, so where does that leave me? <laughs> right? If I'm supposed to be perfect, I know that I am not perfect. Where does that leave me? So let's talk about we, what we care about the most. Let's talk about you. And where does this leave us? I was talking to somebody a while back who was uh, checking out of uh, who was checking out Westridge, and he considered himself to be an agnostic, which means for all practical purposes that he's ambivalent to any beliefs in God. And he wanted to get my take on the Christian faith, and so we sat down and we talked. But as we begin to discuss his beliefs, he said something that really surprised me. Because he said, you know, as far as the values and beliefs of Christianity go, I can get behind that. Like, I love all the love your neighbor as yourself stuff. That's all good. He said, and I really do enjoy the church thing. He said, I, I, you know, the music is fantastic. He didn't say anything about the messages, by the way. <laughs> then he, he pauses for a moment, and he says, I guess if I were to sum up in a word as to what my real issue with Christianity is, I would have to say that it is this. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. I mean, I have a real problem with the whole Jesus thing, he says. 
He said, how can a loving God throw a person who lives a good and moral life into the pits of hell just because he doesn't believe in Jesus? So now we're down to the core of his issue, right? Which, quite frankly, is an issue probably for a lot of us in this room. And so I asked him, I said, so do you believe that everybody, I said, do you believe in heaven and hell? And he said, yeah. And I said, so do you believe that everyone in the world, no matter what they've done in their life, should go to heaven? And he said, no. I said, well, then who wouldn't you let in? If it were up to you, who wouldn't make the cut? He said, well, bad people. I said, define bad people. He said, you know, people who steal and, and kill. And I said, so do you think that you've ever been classified as a bad person? He said, well, I've done bad things, but I don't think that I would be consider my, I wouldn't consider myself to be a bad person. I said, fair enough. And so we were sitting up by a chalkboard, and I handed him a piece of chalk. And I said, okay, here's what I want you to do. Take this chalk, and I want you to draw a line down the middle of the chalkboard. And I said, now on the top, I want you to write the word heaven. And on the bottom half, I want you to write the word hell. And now I'm going to ask all of you to do the same thing that I asked him to do. Take the chalk and write down the name of every person that you know and pick. Where do they go? Heaven? Hell? Impossible? I mean, think about it. If you, if you believe, like most people, that good people go to heaven, good moral people should go to heaven, and that there are also, that there are also by default people who aren't good enough, people who are bad enough to not get into heaven, then where are you drawing the line? Should it only be those people who can keep it down to just, what, one sin a day? Can we say one sin a day gets you in? How about a sin a month? A sin a year? One sin a year. And if it's just one sin a year, then how many of us could honestly say that we're going to make it in? Because I honestly think that my quota for sin is way greater than one a year. Or maybe we should draw the line differently. Maybe we should draw the line based on how bad the sin is, right? Should the line be drawn for people who steal? Should that be the line? If that's the case, then what about the 10-year-old kid who's living in India who doesn't have any food and so he steals a loaf of bread? Does that get in or out? Who's picking? Or what about line? Right? Should it be the line, should the line be drawn for those people who just out and out lie, or should it also include those of us who do little little white lies? Like when your wife asks you if her butt looks big in this dress. <laughs> which it never does, honey. <laughs> But if you're holding the chalk, where do you draw the line? When you think about heaven, you have this picture in your head, right? Who do you have in your head that's walking through the front gate, head held high, neon sign above the front door of the pearly gates, flashing, welcome, welcome? And who do you see trying to sneak in the back door through the kitchen? And who do you envision not even being able to get close to those pearly gates at all? Most people believe that Jesus will make his decision about who gets in and who gets out based on how good or bad a person is in this life. Presumably like a balance sheet, right? And so you have the good things on one side, you have the bad things on the other, and you better pray that on the last day, that the good outweighs the bad. Or you're just out of luck. That, 
couldn't be any further from the truth. So then how do you determine who is good enough to let in and who is bad enough to keep out? If I were to put the chalk in your hand and you were playing God, where do you draw the line? Jesus came to earth, and in his teaching, he blurs the line. He came to change the rules and say it's not about morality. It is not about comparing to see whose sin is worse, whose faith is stronger, who's more religious looking, who prays a better prayer. It's not about being a good person, because if it was about being a good person, I'm telling you, you're not good enough. Jesus makes it very clear, you would have to be perfect. But it was Jesus who blurred the lines of what people were being taught at the time and what they believed by sitting down in somebody's home who was a known sinner and having a meal with them. People that the Sadducees would have looked down upon and never been caught dead associating with that person. It was Jesus who blurred the lines by forgiving the woman who was caught in adultery. She clearly crossed the line, and yet he forgave her. It was Jesus who forgave the Roman tax collector who skimmed a little off the top. Stealing from his own people couldn't be worse, and yet Jesus forgave him and loved him. It was Jesus who drew a whole new line as he was hanging there on the cross and he looks over at this common criminal who was hanging on the cross next to him getting ready to die and before he slips away from this earth, Jesus says, surely today you will be with me in paradise. The one belief that sets the Christian faith apart from every other world religion, every other world view is this. For God, so loved the world that he gave his only son. And whoever, anybody and everybody, whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, he didn't have the heart to draw a line. You know why? Because he knew we'd screw it up. There's a whole long history in the Old Testament of the pattern being repeated over and over and over again of just screwing it up. He knows how that story ends. For God so loved the world that he didn't have the heart to draw a line because he loved everybody so much that he created a plan whereby that he would not have to exclude even one person. Not even one. Christianity levels the playing field like no other religion in the world so that nobody can think of themselves as any better than anybody else. Christianity is the most inclusive. Let me say that again. Christianity is the most inclusive faith that I know. Because nobody can think of themselves as any better than anybody else. No matter what color your skin is, no matter how much money you have or don't have, no matter what your past looks like, no matter how bad your biggest sin seems like it is, there are none of us that are good enough to make it into heaven on our own morality. And so if the Bible teaches that the requirement to get into heaven is to live a perfect life. There is only one thing that prevents us from getting into heaven. It's our sin. And all of us are sinners and far from perfect, and so that tends to be a problem except for one thing. It's this crazy thing that you almost can't articulate, this thing called grace. I'm going to see if I can't illustrate it for you. 
if my hand represents me, Darren Sloniger. And this Bible represents the sin in my life. So all of this is who I am, right? Me and my sin. It's a full package deal. And God loves us, the sinners, but he hates the sin in our lives. And so he reconciled this by sending his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to die on the cross for our sin. So that whoever believes in him will not perish, but he causes, if we come to him and we accept his grace and we accept his forgiveness, he causes the sin of us all to fall on him, leaving us what? Sinless. Perfect. All of a sudden, I'm in. All of a sudden, I make the cut. Not because of anything that I've done, but because of what Jesus did for me. God said, I want you to be with me for all of eternity so badly that I have done everything for you. And all you have to do is to accept the forgiveness of my son who went to the cross. And all you have to do is accept his free gift of grace. But here's the point. Everyone is invited. But not everyone accepts. The only one who is excluded from Christianity are those who exclude themselves. You see, the only way that we can have a relationship with God is to get rid of the sin in our lives. This sin, this sin blocks my relationship from God. And so if I choose in this world to get rid of my sin in this life, then I can have a relationship with God. And if I get rid of my sin in this life to have a direct relationship with God in this life, I have a relationship with God in the next. But if I make the decision that I'm not going to do anything about this sin, and I leave this sin in my life, it is not only a barrier between me and God in this life, it is a barrier between me and God in the next. And by the very definition of hell, hell is the place where God is not. How can we believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sin and not believe that he is the only way to salvation because the only way to have forgiveness is through the act of Jesus going to the cross. This, this is at the heart of the Christian faith. And before we decide to be a good Christian and pick up the chalk and start drawing lines and telling people who's in and who's out based on their beliefs, I'm telling you, the bottom line is that Jesus teaches you that it's none of your business. Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged. He says, before you go looking at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye for the stuff that they've done in their lives, take the big dang plank out of your own eye. In other words, you have enough issues in your own life to worry about without worrying about what's going on in somebody else's life. Keep your focus where it belongs on your own messed up life. In uh, World War II, William Barclay tells a story about uh, a troop of American soldiers who were over in Europe and they were engaged in a couple days of fierce fighting. And in that fighting, they lost one of their men who they were very close friends with. And they knew that they were going to be shipped out and they had to travel a long distance in order to get out. And so they didn't want to leave his body on the battlefield. And so they took his body back to a little village that was nearby that they had scouted out where they knew that there was this little church with a cemetery with a little white picket fence around it. And so they thought that that would be the perfect place to bury their friend before they left. And it was just before sunset by the time they got to this little village. And the soldiers knocked on the door of the parsonage, and an old priest came to greet him. And they explained to him what the situation was and what they wanted to do. And he said, well, was your friend a believer? And they said, well, we don't know. He said, I'm really sorry, but the only people that can be buried in that cemetery are people of faith. They were a little taken back. 
and the soldiers turned around with the body of their friend and started to walk away. And the priest thought for a moment, and he stopped them. He said, hey, you can bury your friend just on the other side of that fence. Right? There's a grassy area there, and as long as you don't bury him on the inside, you can bury him right there. And so that's what they did. The small band of brothers got together. They were a little bitter about the situation, but they did it anyway. They didn't have any other options. They were exhausted. They have a little sort of a funeral service for them, and they bury him just outside the fence of the cemetery. The next morning, they get up, and before they leave, they want to pay their last respects to their friend, and so they walk over to the graveside, but they couldn't find the grave. And they look all over, but they can't find it. So they go to the parsonage, and they knock on the door, and they told the priest, it was really late last night, we were tired, we must be confused about where we buried him, but we can't find the graveside of our friend. And the priest got this huge grin on his face, he goes, after you guys left, I just didn't feel right about the situation, I couldn't sleep, so I got up last night, and I moved the fence. You can find your friend on the inside now. That's exactly what Jesus did. The Pharisees were so fanatical about religion, and they were so fear-based and had all of these rules where they wanted to protect their image, they wanted to protect their power, that they created all these fences around people to say who's in and who's out. But they clearly made a little kind of a fence around themselves and said, we're in. But Jesus came along and he moved the fence. Jesus raised the bar of what it takes to get into heaven so high that not even the proudest of Pharisees could get in. And then he moved the fence of the law that was designed to keep everybody out. And before you knew it, here's what happens. Jesus moved the fence so all of a sudden, sinners and adulterers, and thieves, and people who stole from their own people, they were suddenly finding themselves inside the fence, and all of a sudden, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees, and the scribes were on the outside of the fence. Only Jesus could pull off a move like that. Our mission as a church is to bring a little piece of heaven to this earth, to bring a little light into a really dark world, and to preach that our God is a God of second and third and fourth chances. And we want to be a place, a safe place, where no matter who you are or what you've done or what you've encountered or how bad you think your sin is, that there, what you will encounter here is not judgment. but a place that you can heal. A place that you can find Jesus. The real Jesus. A place where you can encounter a little piece of heaven right here on earth. Thank God that, that Jesus raised the bar so high that nobody could attain it. Thank God that he moved the fence so that somebody like you more importantly, some messed up buddy like me all of a sudden could find myself on the inside because we encountered the grace of God before it was too late. Will you sing this with me? Amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see.